Thank you very, thank you very much. Well, well, firstly, thank you for thank you for the invitation, and I'm genuinely sorry that I can't be with you in person today. Um, I was I was reflecting. It's it's been my privilege to to visit South Africa on a number of occasions. In in fact, I got married in South Africa, but um, the first time uh, I came to South Africa was was back in 1995, and um, and I was outside uh, the Union buildings in Pretoria on the first anniversary of Nelson Mandela becoming president. Um, and it was a time of great celebration, of great positivity, of great change and, and enthusiasm for um, what the future might bring. Uh, and as we approached the 10th anniversary of his sad passing and the 30th anniversary uh, of him becoming uh, president of, of South Africa, what a, a good opportunity to reflect on his legacy uh, and whether that has been fulfilled and whether there are further opportunities um, to enhance confidence in parliament and uh, and in democracy. So I'm, I'm certainly not going to tell you what I think the answer is. I think as a country, you probably had lots of people uh, in the past trying to tell you what they think the answer is uh, and and it's ultimately uh, got to be something that that you determine for yourselves but I will give you uh, a, a specific example from from the UK experience uh, which might give you some uh, indicators and some some food for thought so Anthony will recognize um the uh information on the right hand side of, of, of this slide um, just to say that democracy is is certainly not easy and it's it's not inevitable it does require there to be trust and confidence from the public in those elected representatives um, and as Anthony said we do have a system of first past the post geographically based constituency members of parliament 650. Uh, across the country as a whole and that does mean that they have a specific uh, group of constituents in a geographical area to whom they are responsible um, and part of our role uh, as uh, as Moira said having been created in 2009 is to ensure that they have the funding that they need to be able to support those constituents uh, effectively but when you have a very large number of people electing a very small number of people to represent their positions, uh, then the requirement for trust and confidence is absolutely paramount and the only way in which any form of parliamentary democracy can work going forward. But as we've already heard, trust in politicians is low and even with a wide variety of oversight and regulation general trust in politicians remains low so one of the polling organizations in the uk um, ipsos have run something called the veracity index which looks at people's trust in professions they've been running this consistently since 1983 so 40 years uh, of, of results and they list a variety of professions and ask uh, a sample of the public whether um, they would generally trust that profession to tell the truth or not. Unfortunately, in the case of politicians, the peak of that uh, polling was in 1999 and only reached 23%. So more than three quarters of people would not have generally trusted politicians to tell the truth. I would have said that that fell to an all time low in, 20, in 2009, which was around the expenses scandal to which Moira, Moira referred. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, shortly. It was such a large uh, political event in the UK that we do still refer to it as the expenses scandal and people know what you mean. There have been a variety of other uh, concerns expressed since, but it is the expenses scandal because it was front page news for a considerable length of time. At that point, trust in politicians fell to 13 uh, percent. So broadly, one in eight people trusted politicians to tell the truth. But it did then start to slowly recover. 
Um, and by 2021 had got back to 19%, still less than one in five, still far lower than you would expect. And you'll see on the next slide how that compares with some other professions, but it was recovering. However, unfortunately, um, in 2022, it dropped again to a new all time low of 12%. It's likely that that was predominantly driven by um, some of the impact of COVID and, and particularly um, individual uh, members of government uh, up to and including the Prime Minister being uh, investigated and fined by the police uh, for failing to comply with their own COVID rules and restrictions that they had uh, enforced on others, but also concerns about um, particular members of parliament who had been through an independent uh, investigatory process for particular aspects of their behaviour, the reports of those independent investigations are presented to Parliament and the expectation was always that they would be rubber stamped effectively, um, but there were concerted efforts not to pass certain reports and to change the rules retrospectively that ultimately led to um, Boris Johnson ceasing to be the Prime Minister and to a number of other kind of political changes in, in short order that were um, fairly, perceived to be fairly disastrous um, for the country. Obviously, I can't say that because uh, I work for an, for an independent body, but I, uh, th that was the public uh, perception. The, the image you can see on the right, for those for those of you, I mean, Rishi Sunak, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, polling, polling at 12% um, at, at as a politician. The gentleman on the left you might be less familiar with is, is a journalist uh, by the name of Piers Morgan, uh, who's heavily implicated in um, uh, legal action against journalists uh, with respect to illegal gathering of information on celebrities uh, and, and other high status individuals. So uh, the trust in journalists running at two and a half times uh, that of that of politicians. And just to put that in context, um, nurses, engineers, doctors, 85 to 90 percent trust. And you can see you can see the list there. Um, the police at 63 uh, percent pollsters, the people who conducted this survey down at 49 percent. But the lowest of all of the professions uh, politicians in general at 12 percent, although those with executive powers, so the government ministers polling slightly higher at 16 percent. That is something um, that I think will take us some, some time to recover from uh, and, and also demonstrates that even in a system where there is quite a lot of oversight and regulation and codes of conduct, uh, all of those things together do not necessarily generally uh, persuade the public that they can trust their politicians. So there is something more fundamental about people's belief in how politicians operate that goes above and beyond just the systems that are in place to uh, to regulate them. So the expenses scandal was a was a significant uh, democratic crisis uh, in in the UK. Uh, you can see some of the newspaper headlines uh, there. MPs claiming for uh, in quotes phantom mortgages. Uh, and and the almost world famous now uh, Duck House, which was uh, an individual MP who claimed for restoration work uh, on the Duck House on the island in the moat of his ancestral family home, uh, suggesting that it was a legitimate kind of parliamentary uh, expense. What's actually interesting uh, about the expenses scandal is that the majority of the claims that were highlighted were actually legitimate under the rules as they existed at the time. So the problem was not that individual MPs were necessarily breaking the rules, it's that they were the judge and jury. They were setting the rules and the processes by which they were uh, judged and then they were pushing the boundaries so that they were within the rules, but in a way that no member of the public would perceive to be acceptable and to be in line with what any other um, person might reasonably receive within, within their employment. 
As a result, uh, the Parliamentary Standards Act was passed in 2009, and that created us as an independent uh, regulatory body to administer MPs pay and business costs, uh, and we started operating the following year. Part of the difficulty of a regulatory landscape which is born out of crisis and you might say this is inevitable given the age of our parliamentary democracy, but we have a tendency to create oversight and regulation relatively ad hoc and in response to a crisis and something going wrong, which is why I reflected uh, at the beginning on uh, 30 years uh, since uh, Nelson Mandela became, became president, because actually, you know, that is a milestone that gives you an opportunity to review the systems and the processes and whether they're working effectively in a slightly slower time outside of a crisis, because in a crisis, you will jump to a conclusion that may not serve you particularly well or may need, lead to a very fragmented landscape. And that is one of the things that we have a difficulty with in the UK. So um, there are a multitude of regulatory bodies uh, and oversight functions in the UK, all with slightly, juristic, slightly different jurisdictions. And that means that it's very difficult for the public and sometimes for members themselves to understand who is responsible for what. So we have the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards, who is predominantly looking at behaviour. We have uh, ourselves. We look at the public uh, funding of MPs effectively. The Electoral Commission looks at um, uh, parties and donations. Uh, there are a variety of other uh, independent or semi-independent uh, organisations and uh, committees of MPs themselves who all have different and sometimes slightly overlapping roles. And that list that you can see there is not completely comprehensive. They're just uh, the, the sort of uh, most, uh, most well-known. They all have different powers. Uh, some are advisory, some have enforcement through to the power to criminally prosecute uh, in particular circumstances. So we do three things effectively. Um, we determine MPs pay and pension arrangements so we do that by looking at other public sector pay. Uh, we benchmark against other jurisdictions outside of the UK and what elected members earn. Uh, and we try to ensure that MPs are paid on a fair um, and equitable basis. It's important that they are paid a reasonable amount of money. There, there are two reasons for that, I think. The first is that we do not want politics to be the preserve of those who have independent financial wealth. We do not want being a member of parliament to be something that you have to be able to afford to do because that disenfranchises a huge uh, percentage of the of the population who would not be in a position to take on that role if it weren't remunerated effectively. The other side, of course, is if you pay politicians at a very low rate, it creates the opportunity for people to come to them and say, I can help you to earn more money. I could give you an inducement. If you help me, I can help you. And it creates an environment where corruption is perhaps more likely to occur. So, so we do try to make sure that MPs are paid fairly, that their pension arrangements are broadly similar to those of, of the rest of the public sector, um, to remove those barriers from people. It's a very contentious subject. We, uh, we get criticised uh, every single year with a range of contributions from people thinking that MPs should do it out of the goodness of their heart and it shouldn't be a paid job at all, through to other individuals thinking they should be paid twice as much as they currently are. There, there is no answer that will keep everybody happy all of the time. But it's an annual debate that we, uh, that we have with, uh, with the public. Our main day-to-day -day activity is regulating what we call MPs staffing and business costs. It's what used to be called expenses, 
but the word expenses has connotations. People believe that MPs were using expenses to boost their income and that they were making personal profit from the things that they were claiming. That was broadly never never true and, and is not true now. So what we do is we set MPs an, an annual budget uh, to operate uh, as an MP within their constituency. Uh, the rules by which they can spend that money, we then monitor their compliance, make sure that they are doing what they should do with the money that's available, and we ensure that there is transparency to the public uh, through publication. And then we have an ancillary role off to one side, which is very much an administrative function and that we operate the, the payroll uh, for MPs and their staff. So rather than them doing it individually, we, we, we do that uh, on, on, on their behalf. Um, and we genuinely believe our responsibility is to help support MPs to ensure that they have the resources they need to undertake their parliamentary duties. There are broad principles within within the scheme, um, so they have to they have to use public money for parliamentary purposes. They cannot use that funding for um, for uh, for party political purposes. They have to look to achieve that value for money. Uh, they are accountable, personally accountable for the money that they spend. And in some circumstances, we will claim money back from their own personal pocket if they have. Um, used public money uh, in a way that's considered inappropriate. And of course, we expect probity um, with, with, the, with the spending of that money. Those principles within the scheme all sit underneath the broader Nolan principles um, that, that Fazella talked about at the beginning. When we were set up, we were very much focused on very detailed, complex rules, lots of prescription, treating all members the same, not giving any scope for people to operate differently, and a perception that we were only interested in trying to catch MPs out. We devoted our time to um, or almost deliberately setting rules that would uh, enable them to fail and then making a big deal of it if, uh, if they did. Um, a, a phrase that was used commonly is that light is the best disinfectant and that we published everything in relation to uh, MPs business costs to a very high level of detail. That has a particular problem, I think, uh, in, in two respects. Firstly, we found over time that some of the detail around travel in particular was enabling individuals to identify patterns of behaviour that MPs would undertake, um, which created a security issue for them. So if you know that an MP is going to be at a particular railway station at a particular time of day, on a particular day of the week, because they always travel on that train, uh, then that creates a level of risk. So we think that the cost should be published now, but not necessarily the same level of, uh, the same level of detail. And also sometimes the level of detail created new stories where there where there simply weren't new stories uh, mps might claim for a variety of um consumables for their office but newspapers would have a tendency to draw out uh, individual items and say well an mp has claimed for a toilet roll or a pint of milk uh, when, when actually it was part of a much uh, a much bigger claim Actually, compliance has always been and continues to be extremely high. Uh, it is in excess of 99% compliant um, and has been for a very long time. You might say, why do we need to exist then? If compliance is so high, perhaps we don't need to exist as an organisation. The other way of looking at it, of course, is that compliance is so high because we exist, because we're checking and because we are publishing. And we do publish claims that are rejected as well as claims that are, accept are accepted. So if an MP has a track record or a pattern of behaviour of claiming things that we say no, then that becomes uh, open to the public and, and goes into the public domain. However, I would argue that regulation doesn't have to be solely punitive. So we have changed our approach. We look to be more supportive. We want to help MPs 
to administer their finances appropriately. We want to give them support, make sure they get things right first time and that they are compliant rather than historically waiting for them to get things wrong and then drawing attention to it. Uh, we know that genuine errors will occur and we can help people to put those right and we can support MPs and their staff where there are grey areas mm -hmm. because no scheme can be so prescriptive as to cover every possible alternative. So advising in advance rather than holding someone to account afterwards uh, is a more cost effective way of regulation. We look to be more risk-based to target our efforts on those who need more help. That's not necessarily because they are badly behaved. It is often because they might be new MPs, they might have new members of staff, so they are more at risk of making errors because they do not understand and have the experience of the system. Um, so that's a circumstantial risk rather than uh, rather than because of a pattern of behaviour. And we also look to be more proportionate. So devoting less effort on low value, low risk spend and focusing more on the grey areas, the higher risk, the areas that are more potentially open to abuse. Uh, and, and the way that we describe that now is that we talk about enabling MPs to focus on what really matters by providing an exemplary and seamless regulatory service. If you were to think that that means we are soft on MPs uh, and we let them get away with things uh, that they shouldn't, then uh, I think the newspaper cutting on the right hand side probably gives an indication that that is not the case. So an individual MP who was found to have submitted fraudulent invoices uh, to claim back money that he alleged he'd paid to a charity, uh, which actually didn't exist, um, that we identified that those were fraudulent claims and that MP, now former MP, was subsequently um, put before a criminal court and convicted and sentenced to four and a half years uh, in prison. So we are still a regulator with teeth where that needs to be the case but actually helping people to get things right at first instance is for the majority of the time far more effective. Those instances of deliberate fraud are incredibly rare within our system, but it is important for public confidence that we demonstrate that we will find them and we will deal with them where they exist. 61% of respondents in a recent survey um, that we conducted felt that MPs pay should be decided by an independent body and 52% felt that MPs business costs should be regulated and approved by an independent body with a, a fairly kind of widespread mix of other alternatives so they were the they for each of those questions um they, they were by far the most uh common response the the remaining 39% in terms of uh, pay was kind of split into lots of small lots of small areas and there was also quite a strong correlation between people who knew about IPSA and who understood our role and the level of confidence mm -hmm. that in business costs were managed appropriately um, but as a regulatory body uh, our history has been based very much on operating under the radar and being quiet about what we do that doesn't give the public confidence so um less than half of the respondents knew that ipsa existed and broadly what its role was and you can see on the right hand side you compare that to certain other reg public sector regulatory bodies in the uk and um, it was quite a lot lower than than the majority uh, of them and even those who knew we existed and understood what we did 62 percent still thought that it was too e easy for mps to get around the rules so there is something about the gap, fundamental gap between the evidence that's available and what people's perceptions are. So I think, I mean, in summary, regulation doesn't have to be punitive. It can be supportive and making sure that we help MPs to get things right first time is, is a really positive approach because actually it avoids some of that scandal and should help to improve public confidence. Um, we think that public confidence is increased by independent regulation, given the public sentiment research that we that we did. Um, 
our landscape is very, very fragmented. And if you have the opportunity to create a stronger, unified approach that is system wide, I think that could only be a good thing um, so that people understand one body is responsible for all of these things rather than trying to understand where they need to go with what kind of uh, issue. Um, and as I say, the public needs to know that that regulator exists and believe that it's effective, demonstrated by the evidence uh, of, of success. So even though we've been operating this particular organisation since 2009 and various aspects of parliamentary oversight and regulation have existed for longer than that, that fragmentation and the public confidence that it uh, that that it instills shows that we clearly still have uh, an awful lot uh, an awful lot more to do uh, to to develop that 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 public confidence in politicians that we believe is absolute absolutely fundamental to being able to deliver a parliamentary uh, democracy. And uh, that is all that I wanted to say. So I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Maureen.